Hi, this is Teddy, and today you're listening to Representative Tavia Golonski from Ohio on Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast Podcast Network. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast family of podcasts, and I am thrilled to be joined today by Representative Tavia Golonski from Ohio. Hello, Representative Golonski. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, we've been following each other on Twitter for a while, and I'm not sure why we haven't had you on yet, but thanks so much for <laughs> for being on the podcast now. So I'm not sure if you know, but I grew up in Ohio, so I have a... Oh. a Fond, fond <laughs> feelings of Ohio in uh, in my heart, uh, and I'm actually sitting in Ohio right now as we record this. Wow, that is awesome! Well, what a great state! <laughs> yes, we're uh, we're double bubbling our quarantine bubble with my family right now. So, <laughs> well, we've all got to do what we got to do, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic and and how it affects state legislatures. So. I believe in Ohio, you guys were on recess for a while, but then you you reconvened. So tell me a little bit about how that worked while while people were sort of on lockdown and quarantine and what it was like coming back to to convene again. Well, thank you. You know, it's been a little a little unusual here in Ohio because obviously no one's we really didn't see this coming. And unfortunately, you know, you've got folks uh, across the aisle who basically were doing a lot of denying. So I don't know if you followed us to see that we actually came back to Ohio, I believe it was late March, maybe even March 30th, 31st, because we were trying to pass a helpful package for Ohioans. And so really in lightning speed, we came back, we passed that. And we did a lot of social distancing. We had on some people, actually nobody had on a mask at that time, social distancing, and we had temperature checks, but it was really spotty. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't very well prescribed or planned. And again, you know, you just sort of chalk that up to, you know, just probably poor planning. But then, you know, we we tried, we're in the super minority here in Ohio as Democrats. And so what we tried to do was try to have a conversation with the majority about what are the best practices. And immediately it just evolved into a a fight really about science versus no science and is any of this even real? And for me, that was pretty unfortunate because what we were left with is I think we did right by Ohioans by passing, you know, legislation to help people, you know, in these difficult times. But then basically, you know, once once the directive came out that people should be wearing masks, then it just became sort of a shouting match of I'm not wearing a mask, you are, you're a lib, I'm a Republican. And it just really got a little crazy. Well, and you have such an odd dynamic here in Ohio with one of the few Republican governors who actually took it very seriously and and listened to to public health officials while at the same time having Republican state legislators and and obviously Republicans around the state agitating to to open up more quickly. What, what how did that play out in the in the state legislature? Well, you know, you, you've pointed out, you know, what's obvious, which is that we have a, basically Republicans run everything that's happening in Ohio right now. However, in an unusual twist, our House Republicans started basically agitating at the governor to open up. And, you know, it just put everybody in an awkward position because, you know, anyone really, I think nationwide, we were getting really good press about what Governor DeWine was doing, coupled with uh, Dr. Amy Acton. And, you know, basically there were groups, there were just unusual alliances were made uh, with some of the gun rights folks, some of the uh, people who claim that they're pro-life, were all agitating to open up the state and basically to go against um, Amy Acton. And even the Ohio House Republicans put together an economic recovery task force. They asked some of us Dems to be on it without even consulting with our leader. And the end result was basically a task force put together just to have um, small business people come on and talk about how we just needed to open up Ohio immediately. And unfortunately, I believe that that task force, as well as some other outside agitators, 
made, uh, they put pressure on the governor to do things that didn't seem to follow any of the science. What we were told, even nationally, was you needed to have 14 days of downward trends. We didn't have that in Ohio, that in Ohio when we opened up. And, you know, I just think that there's going to be a spike. And the result of, of this really poor behavior is going to be that more people are going to be sick that don't need to be. I had a friend who said the other day on Twitter, so when are the reclosings going to start? <laughs> Which I think we're going to start seeing pretty quickly in some yeah, places. <laughs> me too. And again, you know, what I do is I like, I like to get as much information as I can from reliable sources. And if you've been watching, you know, personally on Twitter and then just the national news talking about what's going on internationally, and I believe we've seen some very unusual in Beijing, China, that have caught, you know, their country, uh, you know, off guard and has made them go into some, you know, some more lockdown kind of procedures. And they have what we don't have, which is we don't have the amount of testing and we're certainly not doing any serious contact tracing. And so I think those are going to be our problems going forward. People didn't take the virus seriously and they're not ready for this next wave. So we've, of course, in the news recently, nationally, uh, had a lot of talk about uh, police violence, about Black Lives Matter protests, things that are going on. Uh, You, in the beginning of June, uh, so about two weeks ago now, wrote a a press release saying Black Ohioans are not okay uh, and asking for reforms, uh, which, you know, again, we've just mentioned a Republican supermajority, you know, not all of these things might might pass in Ohio. But what are the kinds of things you would like to see the Ohio legislature taking up? What are the kinds of reforms you would like to see in Ohio to address this systemic racism? Well, one of the very first things we could do is name the problem. And so uh, the Ohio Democrats have come out with a a resolution that's very simple, and it says racism is a public health crisis. If people can't see that by now, I don't know what is going to make them open their eyes. You know, long before any of the the current um, race concerns reared their heads, we've been talking here in Ohio about infant mortality. We've been talking about blacks and black and brown people having more diabetes, more high blood pressure and, you know, poor diets and all of those things we've been mentioning uh, that need to be addressed. And so they haven't been addressed. And so now that we come into more black and brown people being killed by the police and they're unarmed at the time, more people are getting, uh, you know, the police called on them, which could have an adverse at outcome, as we've seen, you know, just from Georgia. And so that's the first thing we decided to do as far as legislation. We, we filed uh, racism is a public health crisis uh, resolution, and it hasn't even been taken up by the majority. And that shows you right there. If you can't even look around what's going on in your own state and make changes, then what are you going to do? The second thing we've done is I, as the criminal justice subcommittee co-chair for the Ohio House, came out with a list of, I think we were up to 25 potential criminal justice and policing reforms that I know can make a difference. So it it goes along with a lot of the national work that you've you've heard discussed. Ban the chokeholds. A chokehold is not necessary. If you're trying to save your life, there are other things that you can do as an armed member of law enforcement. In addition, we've got other reforms listed there too. One of the ones I like in particular, which hasn't been fleshed out and is not part of that legislation, is maybe if you're making 911 calls in order to have the police come on black and brown people, maybe there's an intent there and maybe we need to look at legislation that would make that. Again, I'm not interested in increasing penalties, but maybe there needs to be some sort of a penalty on that. I don't mind the reforms that have also discussed the possibility of uh, you know, maybe we could n- rename our police force, call them peace officers, with the idea being that you're here to protect and serve. So the Democrats have a long list of legislation and criminal justice reform that a lot of it isn't even new. We've introduced before, and it's been ignored. It's about equity, really, and bringing back, you know, the empowerment of black and brown people and their families so that racism cannot have the, the disproportionate impact that it has on them. Do you think that there is a chance that the Republicans will take up some of this or is the the only real uh, remedy for this just to, to vote them out in November? 
Well, here's the thing. If you, anyone's been watching the Ohio legislature, what you'll notice is, is when the Republicans can't, can't come up with good ideas of their own, they just steal ours. I don't mind telling you that if you, it's a fact, if you look at last week, I, the Democrats sent, put out a press release foreshadowing some of our plans. The Republicans took that press release, decided what they, they wanted out of it and filed that as police reforms. And obviously they have better staff than they, than we do. There are more of them. So they have the type of, of infrastructure to quickly file bills that for us take forever to do. And so basically they're interested in stealing our ideas. If Ohioans want authentic public servants who think for themselves, I do think they need to vote out the all every last Republican so that Democrats can take over. We actually have the values in, in all of our legislation. Our values are the same as most Ohioans. For one thing, how about safe gun storage? You know, you any polling that you do, Ohioans are on the same side as the Dems. And that's why I'm saying vote them out. Whether it's mind your own business with uh, women and their health care or safe gun storage or, you know, we need to at least finally be done with the marital rape exception that exists in Ohio law. None of this is rocket science. And if you sit down with the average Bob and Betty Buckeye, they would agree with the things that I'm talking about. And that's what um, Democrats and our values are putting forward. I was so embarrassed last week when my, my Republican colleagues in the middle of the night couldn't even say that the Confederate flag has no place in us in our, in our county fairs here in Ohio. And they, in fact, voted for the Confederate flag. And it's just, it, that's no Ohioans. I would say the vast majority of Ohioans don't want to live like that in the middle of a race insurrection. Now you're going to have people deciding that the Confederate flag should be flown at our county fairs. It's outrageous. I believe I was taught in Ohio public schools that Ohio is part of the union, not the Confederacy. <laughs> Thank you. And, and people are looking at Ohio and thinking, First of all, it, and a lot of people will say to you, oh, it's about heritage and it's about this or that. Well, not Ohio's heritage. You know, like you said, Ohio wasn't part of the, the Confederacy. And so these are, once again, it's race baiting to try to suggest that, that the Confederate flag has anything at all to do with Ohioans. It doesn't. And it's a smack in the face to Sherman and to Grant and all the other great uh, generals who fought in this war who would be looking right up from their graves right now and thinking about how traitorous and treasonous it is to, su to support the Confederate flag when we have other good legislation that's pending that could help Ohioans. And, and nobody's paying attention to it. I know that you were a, a juvenile court magistrate and you're a mom as well. I, I was wondering what sorts of things you're thinking about right now with, with the pandemic, with the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening, everything that you're thinking about sort of going into the into the fall about what we should be thinking about with kids. Uh, you know, uh, there's all this talk about whether kids should be going to public schools, what's right for kids, what's equitable, you know, how do we talk to kids about race? You know, what, what are the sorts of things you're thinking about right now with, uh, with the youth of Ohio and, and things that we should be considering? Well, thank you for asking. And just to let all of your, uh, your listeners know too, I'm also a grandmother. I'm a grandmother of a black uh, child. And he, and along with my son, and, you know, just every black male in my life right now, all I'm thinking about is their safety and security. So I want them to be safe and secure from the pandemic. So I'm encouraging everyone to wear masks when you go in public, even though Republicans refuse to wear masks in the legislature, setting a poor example. And so, you know, that's what I'm doing is encouraging people to be safe and secure. But also, and my little grandson's only three, but one day I'll have to have the same talk with him that I did with my black son, which is if the police pull you over 10 and two, have your hands on the steering wheel, make sure that you arrive home alive, make sure that you check in with me. And please, I've, I've told my own children, grandchildren, and all the kids in my life, I don't want you going to protest because again, we still have the pandemic. I believe people can protest from home. I believe, believe people can make their voices heard a number of ways by calling their legislators, having virtual protests, and doing things like that to be safe from the pandemic and safe from, you know, basically what I consider to be a war on black and brown kids at this point. Yeah, and I I think it's it's so important that we that we talk to not just our our black kids. You know, obviously you need to have these conversations uh, about safety, but you know, with with my white kids too, they they need to understand 
what is going on in the country. They need to understand the, like you said, the uh, that the Republican representatives are are just using things like the Confederate flag to yeah. to stoke racism. And and if we don't talk about it, then they they don't hear about it and they don't know about it. That's such a good point. And you know this. The reason that I feel like the current unrest is different from other times is because for the first time ever, I, as a Black person, have said to my white friends, I need you to help me carry this load. I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. We're exhausted from watching people die. And we're actually grieving. And what I've been so proud and impressed with is the number of my white friends and my own white family members who have stopped, who have We've been standing up themselves to say that Black Lives Matter and also to, to put that into action. People have contacted me to work on legislation. They've contacted me to change their own workplaces through dialogue. They've contacted me that they're starting. These are white colleagues who are putting on their own protests to say that we care about this. And I think what, what America is realizing now is that this race problem isn't just a problem for, for Black and Brown people. What it does is it makes whites less safe as well. It makes them feel horrible about their existence to make, to have this be the mask, if you will, that Americans are wearing. It's a race mask and they don't want to wear it anymore. And they do understand now that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of black men and black people had to lose their lives and brown people as well for Americans to finally stand up and say, this isn't who we want to be. And in fact, People are choosing America. They're choosing it over all of this race baiting. They're choosing it over police officers who, you know, are unwilling to see uh, what's wrong with police brutality and killing. And and I'm impressed with America right now. I'm definitely impressed with the part of Ohio that I see, you know, in small towns. Barberton is part of my district. And they had a Black Lives Matter protest. And it makes me so proud because what people were saying peacefully was, we don't want this. We don't want this for Ohio. We don't want it for America. And actually, they're not going to stand for it. And it's really, really impressed me. Yeah, I think that's been, it's been so great to see. Uh, and, you know, seeing all the the bestseller lists being all books about racism, all books about how to be anti-racist has been super impressive. Exactly. And and again, what, what has happened, I'm not sure, but I believe that even women and, and white women of suburbia, they don't want this kind of a world for their, for their kids and their grandkids. And I think that's the difference this time. Another thing that I'm noticing is, is that the younger generation, I'd say people in their 20s and 30s, they don't want to go back to the, 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 um, the world of their great grandparents. I believe they, they are hopeful and, and they're more than that because they're willing to come out into the streets, you know, to pass legislation, to pick it, to do whatever's necessary in order to make sure that their own children and their own descendants don't have to live in this kind of America. They're done with it. And they, they are making the point that they don't want to live like this. And I've just been really impressed with them as well. Is there anything else that you would like to make sure that we talk about today? You know, there are some some central inequities, some economic problems that we could fix if we had the political will to do it. And I would like to see Ohio and I would like to see the U.S. move in a direction where, you know, in, in case we ever do come into another pandemic like this, we, we don't have to celebrate people as heroes we will have already treated them with the kind of respect and dignity so that they can make um, family sustaining wages. So I think that's one one of the other, you know, viruses that's going around, which is basically poverty and keeping people from economic uplift. Are the the Democrats in Ohio, are there particular bills that have been introduced that you would like to see people supporting or, you know, is there legislation that that could still be created that, uh, that could be helpful? Yes. Thank you for asking. One thing right now, uh, my colleagues of the Women's Caucus have filed and uh, the Democrats have filed bills uh, raising the minimum wage to $15, which I feel is too low at this point, but as a minimum, making sure that people have a higher minimum wage, a family sustaining uh, income, and also paid paid parental leave. You know, there's a way to do that so that there's there's not an economic loss to businesses. And then finally, as I, as I said before, we need to pass the racial resolution that racism, racism is a public health crisis. It is the biggest crisis right now. 
in our lives, I believe, and passing that resolution would go far. But finally, our criminal justice and policing reforms bill package is something that is is revolutionary, but it also, again, will make Ohioans feel more safe. So I, I hope all of those bills become laws. So you have a, a re-election campaign coming up in November. So uh, how can listeners help out with that? Well, if you go to TaviaGalonski.com, that's T-A-V-I-A-G-A-L-O-N-S-K-I.com, I still need money. And what money will help with is it doesn't just help with by race. It helps with all the down-ballot races. And remember, we have an opportunity to change the Supreme Court in Ohio so that we have fair and not gerrymandered districts. And that's what's coming up. And that's what's on the ballot for Ohio. So please think of me, reelect me. But remember, part of doing that is to help in the down ballot races as well, so that we can make real change here in Ohio. Excellent. Well, Rep. Golonsky, thank you so much for talking with me today. Uh, It's been really great to talk to you. And like I said, I have a a real soft spot for Ohio and I I want to see Democrats take over Ohio and, (laughs) and put into place all that really excellent legislation that you're working on. Well, super. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on and have a great day. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at twobroadstalkingpolitics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.